Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Write or Die show. I'm your host, Randy Lee Bosla. On the show, we interview other writers and we talk about mental health from their personal journeys. If you have not already hit that like and subscribe button, go ahead, do that now so that you never miss an episode. Welcome. Today we have David Richmond with us on the show. How are you? Good morning, Randy. I'm fantastic. Thank you. Excellent. So tell us, who is David? Uh, wow. That's, all. That's <laughs> the it. hardest question of the whole show, I know. It's the simplest question that's the hardest to answer. Um, he is a older white guy who cooks, writes, uh, does endurance athletics, uh, does some public speaking, um, uh, uh, leads uh, 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 expressive writing workshops in the cancer community for oh, cool. many, 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 many organizations, um, and who always thinks his best day is tomorrow. Oh, that's not as good. Gotta no, that's live a good in the thing. moment. No, <laughs> well, I know I do. I, I'm, <laughs> what I'm saying is, I'm always looking forward. Okay. 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 So what do you like cooking? I hate cooking. So. Oh my gosh. Well, this past weekend we had at the house, a cooking competition for a friend's birthday. It was me against two Brazilians. They were bringing phyllo dough and bacon and all kinds of cheating ingredients. Uh, I cook anything and everything, barbecue, pizza, oven, smoker, oh, wow. sous vide, you name it. I'll cook it. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. I hate cooking. So very much. <laughs> really? Yeah. I absolutely, you know, it, it actually is a lot like writing. It, it really is. Um, That's true. Because the talent that I have in cooking is one that, um, that you, you, you want like as a writer, right? Well, I don't remember who said this, but uh, so, somebody was explaining writing as in you want the person to get to the end of the book and be completely surprised at the ending and go, of course, that's the ending right? Oh my God, of course that's it. But they had no idea. Well, when I cook, I like, I, the only skill I have is to make sure that everything's ready at the last second. And they're like, oh my God, that's what you were making. That's like, awesome. I like that. The, you you so can come like, cook for me anytime. <laughs> yeah. So my, my, my skill is not necessarily in having the best tasting food although i i hope that it tastes pretty good the skill in is figuring out a way to make it all no matter if it's one dish or 20 dishes and i made 20 dishes at a time for thanksgiving one time is having it all come out finished at the same time that is actually so hard to do it's so hard to do so hard to do yeah well and same thing in writing right same thing in writing To, to make the ending make sense like it, it finishes up. Like you're, yeah. you, you, you know, you, you're like, oh yeah, I got it. Like that makes sense. Oh, I like that. I've never heard the comparison, but the way that you've said it totally makes yes. sense. Nice. Okay, these these writing workshops for cancer. What? Tell yeah. me about that. That's interesting. Yeah. So I lead expressive writing workshops, which expressive writing is traditionally. Um, more like a journaling uh, uh, exercise, uh, uh, dealing with uh, making a list or writing about your feelings or just expressing your inner thoughts a different way. It's really expressive writing has some very measurable health benefits. And through multiple studies that have been done over decades, they've proven that not just for your mental health, but also your physical health, expressive writing can be very helpful. So I think the overall goal, Randy, of expressive writing is to understand how we speak in that inner voice so that maybe we can start to change that. And instead of of figuring out ways to protect our traumas and instead of figuring out ways to enhance our inner fears, it's like a way to just kind of deal with those things in a different way. What I do with my expressive writing workshops is I teach people the foundations of expressive writing, but then I add in some characteristics of narrative uh, writing and creative writing okay. so that they can change the the uh, the dialogue even more. So in other words, I, I teach them how to not use generic words like I was so angry or I, you know, I was so cold, like not generic words. I teach them how to go into the, you know, how, how do you show versus tell? 
it's by telling more, right? Yeah. Like by deeper and deeper and deeper. So I try to explain to them that the deeper, more complex, more revealing and descriptive your writing can be, even if it's only for you and the paper shredder, the the better and deeper the conversation with yourself is going to be. Mm-hmm. And so and that's what I try to teach people in the workshops. That's awesome. So how did you get into cancer specific ones? That um, is just, you know, I've been focused on uh, doing things in the cancer world for, gosh, I don't know, maybe like 15 years. Wow. It started, yeah, it started when um, I went through some major, major transformation points in my life. Um, you know, very measurable, big time um, changes. And when I was going through those measurable big time changes, I kind of saw this uh, pathway to the future that was unending. And it's like, oh my gosh, I'm finally living on purpose. I got my head up. Like I'm making good decisions. Like this is, this is the right path for me. Okay. At the same time. Yeah, it was a good, it was a good time for me. But at that same time, my sister um, was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer and her journey was going to be very short. And so I kind of leaned into like understanding, um, you know, I mean, we knew we had little time together. She had a husband Mm -hmm. and kids and good circle of friends and stuff and was navigating that emotional trauma. But um, I knew we had a limited amount of time together. So I really focused on um, her experience, what she was going through. And then it kind of hit me. And then I was called to, to figure out why Randy, that the people are really good at dealing with tasks related to their trauma, right? The triage, like tasks, like deal with the problem, stop the bleeding, um, you know, find out what- Gives us something to focus on. Yes, but when it comes to how do you feel about it, or when it comes to the emotional stress, or when it comes to the post-traumatic stress syndrome, when it comes to the emotional facets of the trauma, it's a very lonely, isolating, confusing, sometimes desperate place. And I was drawn to why, why is that? And so um, I embarked on a project called the cycle of lives. It's still involved, um, raised money for a bunch of different cancer organizations. And I wrote a book that I just won some awards and had some pretty good sales and, and um, is really making an impact. I'm giving all the proceeds from the book to, to um, uh, different cancer centers, but oh, cool. uh, yeah. But what I did with the book is, um, uh, I interviewed 15 different people over a couple of year period to get super deep into their cancer uh, journeys. But oh, from the emotional okay. side, yeah. From the emotional side. And, um, and, and that, um, that led to this whole project. And one of the side things of this project has come in, in, uh, seeing the value that, uh, expressive writing can do, especially in the cancer community. I, yeah. I deal with other. I, I help other communities too, but in the cancer community, especially it's a very lonely, isolating place, especially when it comes to the inner issues that that are going on. Yes, that is very true. So as you're talking, I'm having, I'm having some little mini flashbacks here. Um, so I had cancer four years ago now. Mm. Um, and when you're talking about the emotional side of it, it's so much harder to deal with hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> like there's there's no better way to say that than a hundred percent you are correct. Um, so at the time it was, you know, the doctor would say, you need to do this appointment, that appointment, whatever. And it's like, okay, yep, done, done, done. And then if somebody'd be like, How are you feeling? I'm fine. I just I have to do these things. Right. And there was never a time to stop and just rest and like figure out emotionally where I was at until probably a good year later that I'm like, holy crap. I could have just died, mm-hmm. <laughs> but you're just, for me, I was just in like this state of, okay, this is what I have to do. This is what the doctor is telling me to do. Let's just focus like you said, task oriented. It helps so much focus on this and then let's go. Um, and every time I would go to the cancer hospital, they had you fill out this little mini questionnaire and it was all about your emotional side. They wanted to make sure that you were doing well emotionally because that is way harder than the physical stuff, I think. <laughs> um, and so every time I had to fill that out, I'm like, I don't know how I feel right now. 
Yeah. And uh, the, yeah, I, I totally get that because, and look, it makes sense that you're going to deal with the tasks related to your camp. That makes sense. Cause you want to, yeah. you know, that, that that's how we're wired is literally to jump in and say, Oh my God, the house is flooding. What, how do I, how do I right? stop the water from coming yep. in? You know, um, but uh, eventually you do have to deal with the emotional side or uh, suppress your emotional issues related to and and i i think that um that there's a, the special quality of humans is our need to bond with other humans and mm -hmm. we really only do that uh we don't have a lot in common with people except for our emotions right yeah. we our experiences are totally different nobody's lives are the same that the, the way we interpret things, the way we use language, the way we express ourselves, everything about us is unique, except for really we share the same basic human emotions. And when we don't know how to deal with the emotional issues, then we can't connect to each other in, in deep and authentic ways. And I thought, like, how tough is that? How many times have I heard in this project, probably a thousand is the answer, but how many times have I heard, you know, I took care of my husband. I took care of my dad. I took care of my daughter. I took care of my friend, yeah. you know, and I put the feeding tube in and I drove them to chemo and I helped them, you know, uh, put food on the table. But you know what? I, I never really asked them how they were feeling or I never felt like they were in a place to tell me how they were feeling. Yeah. You know, and, and it's tough because it's really hard to ask the, the difficult questions. And it's also uh, very tough for you to show an emotional vulnerable side of yourself to people for a number of reasons, maybe because you feel like you need to be tough or you feel guilty, or maybe you're ashamed or maybe you're embarrassed or whatever. And we just kind of push the emotional side um, away. And, and that's what I wanted to explore with the project. I love that because I just remember going through that and then everybody afterwards once you know oh cancer's all gone it's good afterwards every well, how how did you feel and even now when i do interviews um people will say well how, how did it feel when you had cancer and i'm like i wasn't thinking about it when i had it mm -hmm. <laughs> right mm -hmm. i was too busy surviving and doing all of the steps that needed to be done i wasn't thinking about the actual cancer it wasn't until later that I reflected back and dealt with all of that emotional baggage left over from it. Yeah. And uh, there's a million different types of therapy that you can employ. There's a lot of professional help that you can get to help you with those issues. There's a lot of self care and self self work and self therapy you can do. But one of the more prevalent issues that I came across in dealing with that is whether people were equipped to take care of themselves or not, one underlying consistent theme at some level was um, the hesitancy uh, to talk to other people about what was going on. And therefore, cancer was a very isolating place. People felt a lot of abandonment. Um, uh, and and, and it's a, it can be a lonely place, even if you are dealing with your own self-care and self-therapy, it can be a lonely place because, you know, it's hard to start the conversations with other people, even those closest to us. Um, and, and I, and I, and that's the aspect I wanted to, to, to explore is how do we have more deep, authentic, connective conversations with the people around us? Yeah, I you summed it up perfectly. So I'm just going to sit here <laughs> quietly, <laughs> right. which anybody watching the show knows that I'm not a quiet person. I'm just going to sit here. <laughs> uh -oh. so, <laughs> I know that. And that's a wrap. So no. um, that's fine. So what about from your own? So that's, that's what you've been doing. You've been helping everybody, mm -hmm. but what about for yourself? What kind of coping strategies have you used to deal with your own trauma throughout the years? Uh, well, I think writing is a really good way of exploring your traumas. And, you, you know, I think uh, a trauma is interesting and pe pe the way that people deal with their traumas are interesting. You know, I mean, some people are super resilient. And so 
they just say, well, you know, bad things happen and you get over it or wow, trouble happens. You'll bounce back quickly or mm -hmm. what? I, I mean, everybody deals with things. We, we all know people who, you know, break a finger and think that the world is ending and somebody who loses a leg and says, that's an opportunity for me to succeed. Right. Everybody deals with trauma a different way. It's so and true. It's so true. Right. And, and I don't know what's right or wrong. Uh, it is just, it's just an individual thing. And, and I've had uh, what I consider like, okay, no, it's not that big of a deal. And other people are like, what, what happened to you? Oh, like, you know, and I, oh, no, I'm intrigued. What happened? What happened? Oh my God. I could tell you things that, well, maybe they're not that big of a deal, but they, you know, I, I guess they are. I mean, I've had, I, I, you know, before I was 18 years old, I had a gun pointed to my loaded gun pointed to my face twice uh, with threats to pull the trigger. Why? Once I was robbed uh, at gunpoint working at a restaurant mm -hmm. and another another time I was robbed at gunpoint in somebody's house. Um, and then when I oh threatened my. to call the police, they ran and, and somebody else got a loaded gun and put it in my face and said, you're not calling anyone. Get the hell out of here. Oh so, my goodness. See that that's traumatic to me. That's traumatic. Um, I think growing up, I had a lot of trauma as a kid. My parents had 40 years, nearly 40 years age difference between them. Wow. So my mom was 21 when I was born. My dad was 59. And so I had a mom who was very, very angry and mean um, and really didn't want kids and a dad who was really too old to have kids. So my sister and I were super close only because like we lived in a household where, you know, we didn't really have a dad we could turn to. And our mom was not, not somebody you wanted to turn to or could turn to. She was not a, not a good person. Um, and so I think, you know, th that's traumatic. I mean, is it traumatic? Like some people deal with in the world? No, but, but. All know, right. So here's where I will interject because yeah. we at the show, so I'm using the royal we, I guess, because I'm the only one that actually works for the show. <laughs> well, and it's not together. really worked, so I'll volunteer. But anyways, <laughs> we never compare ourselves with other people. And, yeah. and I know that you have said that, um, but I just want the audience to know that one person's experience, whether they consider it traumatic or not traumatic, is still their experience. And another mm -hmm. person, and you had said it, right? One person you know, breaks a nail, it's the end of the world. One person loses a leg and it's not a big deal. Um, so everybody is going to experience whatever situation differently. And it's going to be based on what they have learned from coping strategies, how they were raised, what their environment is, is like, right? So having a loaded gun pointed at you to me, like I said, would be very traumatic, but people don't really have guns around here. So that's right. not it's not uh, a common occurrence. It's yeah. not something you hear about very often. Um, so again, I just want everybody who is listening because you know you can watch or listen from around the world to just know that everyone's experience is valid mm -hmm. and everyone's going to deal with it differently. And that's what I love about the show is everybody's going to share different experiences and share their different ways of dealing with it because no one way is going to work for everybody. Yeah, that's so incredibly well said, Randy. And and when I was interviewing people, and I was interviewing some pretty amazing people, um, it was shocking how true that rang. That just like I compare one person in the book um, is only has a fear of cancer, and the other another person in the book had five different cancers in her adult life. Holy moly! Three of them, stage three or worse, and. Um, neither one's fear of cancer was any less real. Yeah. They were absolutely completely understandable and relatable, but they were totally different. And, um, you know, so, I, I mean, I've, I've found myself, I mean, I was in an, a, 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 I was married to an abusive alcoholic for six years. I had four year old twins. And I, the only reason I got out was because, you know, the cops were called and she was arrested. And I mean, I could never one time ever fight back. Imagine what that's like. Right. I mean, wow. Yeah. You know, it happens to men as well as to women. And so, and also I have a, a plenty of holes I dug for myself that were, 
trauma related or that led to trauma or led to whatever. And so writing has been a big thing for me. Um, but really endurance athletics has, has been another thing. And, um, you know, honestly, I, I think um, with expressive writing, what I've learned is that most people strong, weak, in between uh, having dealing with acute trauma or a post-secondary trauma, I don't care what, most people um, don't have an intimate relationship with the person in the mirror. Mm. And uh, especially when it comes to um, uh, the, the relationship over their traumas. And uh, when I finally decided to take a super crazy hard look at the person in the mirror and really measure what I was good at, what I liked, what I didn't like, what, what problems I had, what patterns I needed to break, what patterns I needed to adopt and develop, um, what, what wiring I needed to redo in my head, what strengths I needed to lean into. When I, when I did an intimate assessment of who I was, that's when I felt like I finally started to understand myself and the way I interacted with the world. And then you kind of can put things into perspective and start to, you know, move forward in a positive way. And I've done that through athletics. I've done it through writing. I've done it through um, self-care and uh, in, in giving back a little bit more and really in understanding my place and where, how I interact with the world and the people around me. And I feel very fortunate to have done that. And I probably wouldn't have done that to the degree that I had, had it not been contrasted against, um, you know, my sister's journey where she wasn't going to have the opportunity to do that. So it kind of made it more desperate for me to go, shit, man, I got the chance to do this. Yeah. You know, not everybody does. Yeah, it's true. Hmm. So tell us a little bit um, more about this um, endurance training that you said is really helpful for you. Yeah. So uh, uh, people are into meditation. They write, they do art they do yoga, um, they read a book, watch a movie, go for a walk in nature, get tattoos. I don't care what it is, but some things are Zen-like for people. They're, they're escapes, their ways of dealing with um, self-care, therapy, whatever. Um, I didn't know it heading into it, but endurance athletics uh, became a place for me to do a lot of reflection and therapy and self-care and, and, uh, exploration. Um, because when you're doing those things I just mentioned, they're occupying your, 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 your physical and your, your emotional and, and mental state. Mm -hmm. But when you're, I don't know, for example, running for 10 hours in the desert, or you're on a, you know, six hour bike ride in the middle of nowhere, I mean, your mind really can work and it can work in really good ways. And I have solved more problems and made more gains in my uh, mental health, my psychological health, my uh, groundedness, my intimacy with myself, and uh, uh, with with endurance athletics than with anything else. It's it's taught me more than anything because you learn so many lessons when you're alone with yourself, dealing with adversity, even if it's self imposed adversity. Mm -hmm. um, you learn so much, and you become a real familiar with yourself in a very quiet way. You know, I mean, uh, you know, uh, writing a book is not quiet because your mind is so focused on the book that, you know, yeah, I, it's an escape. Okay. It's whatever, but you don't get the chance to work on yourself. You're working on the project, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and with, with meditation or, or, or therapy or, or yoga, I thought, you know what? I get like 60 minutes. <laughs> I get like 90 minutes. But mm -hmm. I don't, man, it takes like 90 minutes for my mind to just slow down. And so, yeah. you know, and so what endurance athletics did, you know, when you're in the middle of a, you know, a, a 12 hour Ironman or, you know, I've done, I've done my, my most ridiculous athletic adventure was a 5,000 mile solo bike ride. Wow. You know, you know, when you're doing that kind of stuff, trust me, you can solve a lot of freaking problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh my gosh I will leave that to you <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I'm not saying I'm not prescribing it for anyone. I'm just no, no, I know it know? works for you, and it might work for somebody else. And a it, lesser it, it, amount it, of time works for me. Mm -hmm. I don't think I could do five thousand yeah. miles. No. <laughs> um. Yeah, but you know what? If you when you set a goal, who doesn't feel good setting a goal that's just for themselves and it's, doing whatever they need to achieve it? Yeah. And then, I mean, you've got what? What? Like a hundred and. 130 episodes 160 how many episodes you have um i think like 120 okay 120 oh when you when you first started this did you go okay i want to put together something interesting okay you did that and then you had another goal that said okay i want to do 50 episodes i want to could you imagine ever getting to 100 episodes could you imagine getting downloaded in whatever 15 countries or whatever the goals were yeah and when you were to achieve it i mean how amazing does it feel how much do you learn about yourself pretty you, damn good right mm -hmm. and so um that's the thing with me with endurance athletics is i'll tell you a super quick story i did a 87 mile rollerblade race in georgia okay oh that's cool yeah except for if you don't know how to rollerblade which i wasn't a real good rollerblader <laughs> but i used a rollerblade as a teenager Okay, could you imagine ago. rollerblading at 87 miles? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's just stupid. I was never so, even good at stopping. Yeah, I, neither was I. I was the, literally, Randy, I was the single, because these were like real people. I was the one guy who had the brake on the back of the rollerblade. All the pros, they just slide the other back foot sideways to stop. Oh. I didn't know how to do that. I uh -huh. used the little brake on the back yeah, of the rollerblade. Yeah, that's what it's for, isn't um, it? Yeah, and everybody looked at me funny, like, what kind of rollerblades are you wearing? And I mean, this is a real race. <laughs> so about 30 miles in to the race, I was like three and a half, four hours in. I hit the wall. I was done. I couldn't make it another step. Like, it was it. I was I was over. But I still had like 60 miles to go or I could go home. Yeah. And I didn't want to go home. And so I just figured out a way to just like keep going. And when you figure out a way to keep going, you know, uh, it's just one, you know, I got to do one more thing before I get this right. I got one more thing to get to my goal. It's like, it's a learning exercise. And so mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if you're, I'm not going to assume anything, but I'm guessing that your podcast, as much as you brought to other people has also given you a much better oh, understanding yes. of, of who you are. And I love my podcast. I want it to one day just be what I do all the time. <laughs> right yeah and so how rewarding is that and it's also probably a journey of discovery um, yeah it's it's it could be a sense of pride it could be a self-imposed um, wall that you need to figure out how to climb up or knock over or whatever and so I, I you know I, I love these kind of challenges for, for me in terms of athletics is one of those things that that challenges me in a very very um, unique and powerful way yeah, that's fabulous. My dogs just got let outside. I'm I'm on the top floor and I just saw the two dogs out there. Nice. <laughs> nice. Um, that's fantastic that you, you know, and it's just like what you've been saying this whole time. If you set yourself whatever goal it is, whether you like meditation, whether you like rollerblading, whether you like podcasting, um, you set the goal and you feel so good when you hit it. Like I remember when I hit my first, the the first 50 subscribers, I was like running around with my phone. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, then it was, and it right. just kept going. Right. Because it's yeah. so exciting to do yeah. that. Yeah. It, it makes it's you really feel cool. good. Yeah, exactly. And especially when you set the goal for yourself right? Yeah. If it's not somebody telling you, you should do something. And trust me, when you're not a professional athlete and you sign <laughs> up for a marathon or you sign up for an Ironman or you embark on a 5,000 mile bike ride, nobody's paying you. Nobody cares. Nobody's watching. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's your, your own goal. And so the fact that you're motivated to accomplish it is a, is a very personal and very personally rewarding thing, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. So what is your unsolicited piece of advice for somebody who is listening right now who is trying to figure out what would be something helpful for them? And you don't know this person very well. They're just, you know, they're just listening, going, hmm, I'm really vibing with you. 
but I, I need one more little one more little piece of unsolicited advice. Hi, hey, I'm not great at giving advice, but I I would say I have an observation. Oh, okay, I like and that. The, the observation is when I was doing the book Cycle of Lives, and I'm interviewing you know dozens and dozens of people for a book about the emotional journeys with cancer. What I really observed was the true depth of the idea that you don't know what people are going through or what they have gone through. You have, you have no idea. Yeah. I mean, you have literally no idea. And um, it, it's it, the true depth of that thought is really sobering because um, you know, you could, and I'm, you know, I don't wish this upon you, but you could have just walked into this room and put on the happiest face after having a most miserable experience five minutes before, yeah. or you could have to, I don't know, go fire an employee five minutes from now. And that's weighing you down. Or maybe you're dealing with the death of a pet, or maybe you're dealing with, you know, failing at some goal and feeling absolutely miserable. I mean, there's a million things that we could say that are absolutely true that yeah. anybody could be going through at any time. And my observation is that no matter what you think you know about someone and what you try to read in your interaction with them, there's so much more behind the scenes. There's so much more under the surface and with you, but, but also with them. And, mm -hmm. and my observation is what's missing from people's worlds a lot of time is true, deep, authentic connection with people that are there, that are present, that are listening, that can ask the right question, that can tell me more and can be there to help them through a difficult moment or a difficult time or, you know, whatever. And so I don't have advice, but I have an observation. And that is that's good. You know, when, you, when you're hiding something, the 20 somethings that are going on in your life that you don't let others know about because you don't want to bring them down or you're ashamed or you're embarrassed or you're afraid or whatever. Trust me, every single person you're coming across is dealing with that, that same thing. Uh, that is great observation. So where do we get this book? Uh, well, the book is available wherever books are sold. Uh, it, it did hit Amazon bestseller status uh, after it came out. It's still doing pretty good. The sales are pretty good. It, ha it has an Audible version. Oh, I love Audible. Okay. Yeah, you know, it's really cool. It's, so it's 15 different stories. And in between the stories is my narrative of the bike ride and kind of some of the thoughts about um, uh, my grief over losing my sister. But the 15 stories are super crazy, inspiring human experience type stories. Um, and I had 15 different actors do each one of those 15 people. Oh, so I, yeah, that Audible, sounds, it sounds way better to listen to this. Yeah, the Audible is really cool. So I narrated the in between the transitions, but I had 15 voiceover actors uh, do the 15 different uh, parts of the book that, that oh. are you know, each person from those people's experience. So the Audible is great. Um, and then, of course, you know, I do workshops and public speaking and I sell you know sell books you know during those times or give them away or whatever so just look up cycle of lives look up David Richmond and and we will connect if you think you could be touched by it that's awesome and where do people follow you at cycleoflives.org I have a uh, Facebook and Instagram and all that nonsense that we have to have when we're building audiences but um but really they can go to cycleoflives.org Okay. and see the different organizations that are supported you find out about all the different projects i'm working on and maybe hopefully be inspired to uh to uh, form some deeper connections with people excellent and so we're gonna have that link down in the description below yeah. um and thank you again so much david for coming on the show and sharing with us yeah, you're welcome, Randy. Appreciate you taking the time and continued success on your podcast. And one of these days when you go, you me I remember I was telling that guy when I could do this for a living, when you're doing it for a living, call me back and have me again. I will. I'll be like, yo, guess what? Yeah. <laughs> Love it. I hit my goal. Yep. As yeah. always, thank you so much for the amazing guests that we have on the show. Um, be sure to check out their links down in the description below. 
If you want to support the channel, go ahead and check out our merch store. We've got some very cool things on there. That's my favorite. Sorry, I'm busy ending the stigma. Um, but there's some other very cool designs. 10% of the proceeds always goes back to the Canadian Mental Health Association. Be sure to follow us on Facebook at RV Media because we have some great new shows coming up and you never want to miss any of those episodes. And remember, the only way to end the stigma of mental health is to speak openly and honestly. Bye!